Welcome to Life Club. This is George G. And the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, strong and powerful Dr. Richard Winters. Dr. Winters, are you ready to do this? I am ready. All right, let's go. Dr. Winters is an emergency physician at the Mayo Clinic. He's the director of leadership development for the Mayo Clinic Care Network. He's an executive coach and the author of You're the Leader, Now What? Leadership Lessons from the Mayo Clinic. Richard, tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work and why you do what you do. Yeah, so personal life, got to have a wife and two daughters um, who are 17 and 19. Um, I'm an emergency physician here I, in, uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, and then also spend a good amount of my time helping to develop leaders, coaching leaders, and generally trying to make the world a better place. Well, amen on that. Yeah. So 17 and 19. So okay. how do you feel? How do you feel like you did developing those leaders, Richard? Yeah, I, actually, I think that I've, I think they've done pretty well. I think the the key thing for me is I got out of the way. They're they're confident and and they're finding their way, and that's exactly what I want. Got it. Well, I certainly appreciate that. So interesting. I don't know how many emergency room physicians or physici physicians in general are also executive coaches. Is that common? Or are you an outlier? Yeah, no, I don't. I'm. I, hopefully, it becomes more common. And so for me, I thought about. I had never heard of coaching. I I went to business school, and during business school, there was a just a, a a class about coaching. And I had thought about coaching as being, I don't know, like uh, dream catchers and talking about your feelings <laughs> and stuff. And and but what I found was it was a way of actually thinking about how we think. And for me, it was very very powerful for me to figure out how I'm thinking and processing the world. And then as I'm working with colleagues, just to be able to approach them as a coach to help them make sense of this, uh, this very complex world. Got it. So I think that, 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 that makes all the sense in the world. Let's, if you don't mind, let's take another step back. You went to medical school, you were a physician, and then you went to business school. What was the progression there? Yeah. So so go to med I went to medical school at Mayo and then went out to California and did my emergency medicine residency and then went into practice. And so seeing one patient at a time, emergency uh, problems, and start seeing things, you know, I think this could be better. I think we could change this. And either you're shouting, you know, into the abyss or you start going to meetings. And as I'm going to meetings, I'm starting to hear different language. And, and so the leaders of the hospital are, are speaking just a different sort of, you know, different words. And so I decided to get an MBA. And as a result of that, started learning the language of finance and marketing and, and all, all that sort of stuff that, that individuals in business know. And for me, that connected me more with the patient. You know, instead of taking care of one patient at a time, then you can start to take care of populations of patients at a time. And, and basically, that was it, is growing to become a leader and just really wanting to learn more about the situation. No, well, I think that that's, I think that is admirable in a, in, 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 in every scenario. So, so I, I, I appreciate that. Working with the, the healthcare apparatus, talk about how these folks have their own language and I'm interested in learning more because I see efficiencies and opportunities and then wanting to have the ability to approach your colleagues or to be able to help coach your colleagues through difficult, um, whatever it might be, how is, how is that received from the administration than from, from colleagues? I mean, I think, you know, just, just popping to mind, just imagine you're going to a different country and you don't speak the language. It's, it's hard to connect with individuals when you're not speaking the language. And so the more you understand the language and the more you can translate the language of others, I think it helps you connect better. And, you know, as a leader, you can either go in the room and say, so as an emergency physician, so I walk into a room and I see a patient and I know what to do pretty quickly. And I write an order. Um, you know, I have 17 and 19 year old daughters. They come to me with, uh, with issues. I've been to high school. I've been to college. I can <laughs> like tell them exactly what I think they should do. But I find in those sorts of situations, the you know the writing in order, telling people what to do, doesn't work out so well, and it doesn't work out so well in meetings also. And so the the language of coaching uh, and understanding the language of others is, I think, really helps you connect with them and helps them 
the real the idea here is helping them to understand um, the best ways to move forward and kind of pooling all the their different perspectives together and, and, and the coaching really helps me from that perspective yeah yeah I think that that's a I think that that's a great a great analogy so you're the leader now what what was the motivator there <laughs> so you know, each I think leaders in all over the world. You know, as you're in these these situations, you're really good at something, and people are like, "Hey, why don't you why don't you have a spot on this committee? Why don't you start becoming a leader, in a formal sort of sense?" And then people find as they get into these leadership roles that, geez, everyone's disagreeing. My colleagues, my friends are kind of they're not happy with each other, and now they're looking to me. And I found over and over again as I'm coaching colleagues, and it's really leaders at all levels. This question of now what. Um, there's this really difficult situation. Now what? What do I do? And and so that's I wrote a book to trying to help individuals just pick out a chapter for issues that they're facing and and now what? Guide them through that. And you're coming at this with with these great perspectives of obviously having gone through intense training and schooling to become a doctor and then going through an MBA program and looking at it through the world that way. Uh, so it's fascinating. Who, who did you write the book for? So, yeah. And as you say that, you know, making a lot of mistakes along the way. And so it's as much writing it for me as I'm writing it for, for my colleagues. It's the whole process of writing is putting something down and saying, do I really think that? And, and, and what more can I add here? And, and what are some different perspectives that I'm not, I'm not getting? And so that the process of writing was really as much for me as it was for colleagues. Now for, for colleagues, it's, it's painful to be put into a leadership role and really wanting to do well. And then finding this is this struggle about what we feel should happen, what we think should go on versus stepping back and, and having others kind of, uh, you know, work together and facilitate. And so moving from commanding and kind of pointing to how do we bring all these different perspectives together? It's, it's difficult. It's, and it's difficult, not just logistically, but emotionally it's, it's difficult for individuals who are wanting to do well and then finding themselves in these situations that are really quite prickly. And so I, my hope is that the book helps individuals through that. Yeah, I think it, I think it certainly will. Has, has doctoring has, has, is, is that the right term? Medicine has, has doctoring. <laughs> Medicinizing. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> as medicinizing. Yeah. As, as the country has, has, has benefited from technology and so consumers, patients are more informed and we've become more political with things like the vaccine. How is that changing the dynamic between patient and, and physician, if, if at all? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's actually from a physician's perspective, as an emergency physician, it's hard because a patient will say, I'm on X and I'll, I'll be in my mind. I'm like, X, geez, I'm not sure I've heard of X. And then quickly go to the computer and look it up and like, then, oh yeah, okay. I understand this is in this sort of class. Things are, are, are just moving so rapidly. It's, it's very difficult. I think from a patient's perspective, the same thing, there's, there are things that come out or, you know, that, that pharmacy, pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical companies create these new drugs and there's, they create these markets. And so how does a patient know? How does a physician know? It's always a struggle of, of keeping up to date on, on what works and what's current, what are the side effects? Um, not too different. I think again, from any other industry, we can, we can look at really any industry in the United States. And I think you're finding situations where, where new products, new information, things are volatile and uncertain and, and leaders and, and also the consumers have to adapt. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So somebody is thrust into or accepts, assumes this new leadership position. They're there. They're, it's like, okay, great. I thought I wanted this. Now I'm not so sure. Or yeah, this is exactly what I wanted, but it's totally different. How open are, how open is, is, is a physician to learning new information and, and, and retooling, recognizing that I have gaps and I need new trainings? It's going to depend on the individual. So there are some individuals who go into leadership positions because they seek power and they want control and they're going to go their direction. Those leaders, in my experience, tend not to do so well. 
we hear about those leaders sometimes, but that tends not to be the case. Um, and, and then there are those leaders who step into roles because they're wanting to make a difference. And um, our best leaders there are learners. I mean, they are they're looking at the way they are receiving the world in these situations, and they're trying to find ways of better doing that. And they're also looking at how they can best help uh, colleagues. And, and then there are leaders, you kind of alluded to this, everyone else steps back and then they're like, okay, it's me. Uh, and I, I find those leaders to be also the the learners, individuals trying to figure out how to how to navigate the world. Yeah, people that are are viewed appropriately as the one for the job, and I accept this responsibility and to do a good job and to serve the people that are relying on me. I need to recognize that I need to learn and reskill or retool or or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah, and there's, and I think uh, we need to like clearly. So there's formal leadership roles where you have a position, but there's a lot of informal leadership roles where there are individuals with no position that we work with, who are the individuals everyone goes to to seek information to try to figure out how to navigate this change to to try to boost up our confidence and connect with our values. And so, I, I don't see, and I wouldn't look at re, a formal leadership role as being the requirements to have a huge effect on our colleagues. Yeah. I, I, it strikes me that, that every, anytime other human beings look to a human being because they're in a situation where they need their help. And certainly when we're talking about our health, uh, it's the one, it's one of the only times that I only want one thing. I want to not feel badly. I want to be healthy again, that the more we could equip doctors, physicians with the tools to to be better leaders that that it makes all the sense in the world yeah and i think yes i think and in general from a human perspective the more we can approach others in ways to help them from where they're at as opposed to where we're at the better we're going to be able to help and so if that's a physician talking to a patient um if it's my agenda it may not be as helpful for you. And maybe your point is that you'd like to hurt less and there, that's maybe one path, or maybe you're, you would like to have, be able to be more able to do specific activities and don't care about the pain as much. That's a different approach. And unless we're actually listening to others and helping them kind of make sense of their situation, we're, we're not going to be able to connect and help them in, in the way that's best for them. And if I only have five minutes with this person and then I have 50 more people that I have to see, that makes that pretty tricky. It is difficult. It is. And if I want to change that, I need to be an advocate and be able to go into that boardroom with those other folks and speak their language <laughs> to actually affect change. Yeah, we we navigate difficult situations, I think all of us. And is that a reasonable thing or is that a ridiculous thing that I just said? Is is do you see an individual physician contributor as someone who has the ability to step up and to say within this organization i can make change we need to change the way that we're approaching patient care yeah i think i think that voices speak up they identify opportunities for improvement and then they can make a change i think there is a reality of the availability of resources and how those real resources are allocated um, I, I think there's could be arguments there, but resources are not unlimited. And so that's difficult. Wouldn't it be great to spend eight hours with someone? It, I mean, it, it might. Um, <laughs> and, it could, you know, it could it, it could definitely be. Um, it, would it be better to spend four minutes than two minutes? Certainly. Um, and, and so I think that that is where the difficulty arises is is matching the resources that are available with the ideas that we have for how we can improve things. And that tug of war is, it's essential because we we need to take care of one patient, but we also need to take care of populations of patients. We need to take care of one colleague in our organization, and we also need to take care of the team and the organization. These are really difficult things. Truly, and talk about being mindful of resources, an emergency room, physician you you 
you recognize we have a finite amount of time to get this person exactly what they need, and we do not have time to make a lot of errors or to spend. So I think that that's super interesting. I spend a lot of time thinking about prioritizing and then allocation of finite resources. Yeah, and as an emergency physician, I think we tend to think of emergency physicians as people who go into these really unknowable situations. But as an emergency physician for 25 years, there's, I mean, we have processes and frameworks for for most everything, uh, the most bizarre to the most common. Um, it's not like we're we're making things up in the moment. And, and so there's best practices that form on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's also the novelty, the, the new stuff that comes in and and our best practices and our frameworks can help us adapt, but we also need to be questioning best practice, which is by definition past practice. Right. Yeah, it strikes me that that is you know, really a big part of. Um, I shouldn't probably be attempting to use these these terms, but it's that's part of the scientific method is to test things and to see how they're holding up and look for opportunities to make them better. So I, I certainly appreciate that how many how many physicians are 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 you responsible for so i am so our organization we have 65,000 employees throughout Mayo Clinic there are around 2,000 uh physician and scientists i am so I, I do leadership development for our organization and then for leaders outside of the organization um i think they're responsible for themselves you know i'm i'm helping um, and then within our department, I, I'm a director of finance or chair of finance and, and do those sorts of things. And so lots of places where I can help out. I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily hiring and firing anyone in my position right now, which I'm happy to not have that, that responsibility. So when somebody picks up a copy of You're the Leader, Now What? Leadership Lessons from the Mayo Clinic, what are you hoping that they will get out of it? What, what? What what should they expect to to receive from from reading it? Yeah, the goal as I wrote it was was really that you, as you're facing these really difficult challenges, um, have a book that you can go to and open up a chapter that, and it'll relate to whether this is a one to one discussion with a colleague, whether you're facing a group of colleagues and trying to figure out how to kind of figure out this really complex situation, whether there's someone who's interrupting you over and over again. Like any of these sorts of things, you can open up a chapter and, and and learn how to how to move forward, and that requires reflection about yourself, and then also reflection about how you're approaching others. How did you make decisions on what to put in and what to leave out? Because I'm sure there's an infinite number of scenarios, situations. Right. It, it's it really was it it's mimics in many ways the arc of a coaching conversation I have with someone, and and so this where we approach things as an expert, and then all of a sudden we find out that our expertise is getting in the way. And so now how do we meet with individuals one-to-one -one and, and colleagues as groups and move forward? And so it it really just reflects that natural process that, that we all go through as we're leading teams and individuals. Nice. So it sounds like it's a, a pretty functional living document book where we want to keep this available for reference as things come up. Yeah, that's my hope. I didn't want something that was full of fluff, you know, one or two uh, key points, and then you write another 200 pages. I really, uh, you know, you kind of working with the editors and saying, no, that doesn't need to be here. I want this to be tight. I want this to be usable. And and at the end of each chapter, there, there are key points and summaries that you can open up and just figure out this is what I need to do. And are you, were you a writer before? Have you always been a writer? <laughs> Um, no, I've never written a book before, certainly, you know, written some blog posts and some tweets. Um, so it, all this stuff comes together in different ways. Give a lot, I deliver a lot of programs and do a lot of public speaking. And that requires, um, you know, writing in a different way that was quite helpful. I imagine just sort of having an outline, getting your thoughts together and attacking it. Did you have a, a process where you say, I'm going to write for this long consistently? Yeah. I mean, you have deadlines. And so the, uh, it, it generally, I would work chapter by chapter. Each of the chapters I had presented in some way. And so I did have the outline as a talk. And and so you just go through and you're right. And uh, you throw some stuff out. You add some stuff. Um, and and it's generally around a thousand words a day. And it is it is something that as an emergency physician during COVID was a bit of a challenge to be writing a book. But it's it, there's time. 
Baker's time. And if you like it, and I do, it was an enjoyable time and a time of discovery. So. I love it. If you want something done, give it to a busy person, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Well, thank thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you, and how can they pick, where Where's the best place to pick up a copy of "You're the Leader Now"? What leadership lessons from the Mayo Clinic? Yeah, so "You're the Leader Now." What is available at you know any of the bookstores that you you go to, and it's available in, in hardbound and electronic, and then also the uh, uh, audio book. And then to learn about me, go you can go to very creatively named richardwinters dot com. And then there'll be some links there. I, I'm on Twitter and, and LinkedIn also. Excellent. If you enjoyed this as much as I did, show Richard your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Pick up a copy of You're the Leader, Now What? Leadership Lessons from the Mail Clinic, wherever you buy your books. Pick up the audio copy as well. Really can't pick that up, but you can download it. You know what I'm talking about. And then go <laughs> to richardwinters.com and... Follow all things Dr. Winters. You can find him on social media as well. I'll link all those in the notes of the show. Thanks again, Dr. Winters. Thank you, George. And until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best. <laughs>